Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our seminar today. I'm Angela Stent, Director of the Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies. And we're very lucky today to have an excellent panel to discuss a very important issue. Um, as you probably know, yesterday, President Putin congratulated President-elect Biden on his election. Um, and in the message from the Kremlin stressed uh, that the US and Russia bear special responsibility for global security and they need to work together to make the world a safer place. And obviously the first thing on the agenda of a new Biden administration is going to have to be paying attention, turning attention to the very important arms control treaty, the new start that's about to expire on February the 5th. And this is gonna be the subject of our discussion today. And we're delighted that Ambassador Antonov and Michael Gordon have both agreed to discuss the subject. So I'm just going to introduce our moderator for today and then she will take over. It is, um, of course, Jill Doherty. She's an adjunct professor here at Georgetown University. She's also a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center, uh, where she runs a series of podcasts. And of course, before that, she was for many years um, a very well-known CNN correspondent, uh, a correspondent from Moscow for a number of years, and then the State Department correspondent. Um, I know that even in high school, she was a very assiduous student of Russian, and she's an expert in all things Russian. So we're delighted to have you moderate this, Jill, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, there we go. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Stent. I really appreciate that introduction. And welcome to our journalist boot camp. We have a little bit of snow here in Washington, DC, kind of giving us a Moscow atmosphere. So it feels very nice and cozy. And I'm glad that everyone can join us for this boot camp. You know, our subject today is complex, crucial, and extremely timely. It's the New START agreement, the New START arms control agreement, and that is the last remaining arms control agreement between Russia and the United States. It entered into force February 5th, 2011, and very, very soon, in fact, February 5th coming up of 2021, it is set to expire. And just, I know I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but just to remind us, it essentially limits each side, Russia and the United States, to a certain number of deployed nuclear weapons to their lowest levels since the Cold War. So no more than 700 deployed strategic missiles and bombers, and no more than 1,550 deployed strategic warheads. So it expires, as I said, it's only 16 days after the incoming president, Joe Biden, will be inaugurated. So it's one of the first, if not the first major national security decision that the incoming Biden administration will have to make and move on quickly if it wants to. So up to this moment, you've had the Trump administration has not accepted Russia's offer to extend New START as it could be extended according to the original agreement for five years without conditions. So the Trump administration didn't accept that. The Biden ad administration has expressed support for extension without conditions. So as Dr. Stent mentioned, we have two really excellent uh, people to discuss this. The first is Anatoly Ivanovich Antonov, the ambassador of the Russian Federation to the United States of America. And why I wanted the ambassador to join us is that he really is the person who knows this subject, probably more than anyone, because he was part, he, was, he headed the negotiating team in 2009 on the New START agreement. He has served as Deputy Minister of Defense, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. He is a very senior diplomat and now here in the United States representing Russia. And we're very glad to welcome you, sir. And we have Michael Gordon, National Security Correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. So welcome to both of you. You know, there are a lot of Russia-related issues in the news today. I think in the interest of time, it would be fascinating if we could discuss the whole gamut, 
but we only have one hour. And so I want to use it wisely and jump right in and reminding our audience, we will talk, uh, I'll be posing some questions, there will be a discussion between uh, Michael Gordon and the ambassador, and then we're going to open it up to questions. So be thinking about those. You can put them into the Q&A function. So just write them right in there. We'll look at them and see that we can get to as many as possible. Uh, Ambassador Antonov, I would like to uh, begin with you. As I've been saying, we're facing this immediate deadline to either extend START or let it die. And President Putin offered to extend it for five years without conditions. The question to you would be, is that offer still on the table for the Biden administration? And if it is, do you expect to be able to reach agreement with the incoming administration? I would like to welcome everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to be with you. Uh, today is a very unusual uh, day because we can see snow outside of our windows. It's a little bit chilly, uh, but uh, our discussion, I hope, will be very interesting because uh, it touches interests of uh, uh, United States, Russia, and international community as well. Uh, I'll try to explain where we are. I'll try to explain you why we have failed till now. And of course, I'm uh, optimistic and I, uh, I will be waiting when the administration uh, uh, can start working and when there will be an invitation for me, for my colleagues to come to State Department, to White House, to Pentagon, and to start uh, real uh, negotiations, not discussion, but negotiations. It's very important for us. Uh, if you permit me, I will take a few minutes just only to explain where we are, uh, and what uh, we are planning to do, and whether our proposal uh, is still uh, on the table. The fate of a new start uh, is a central issue for strategic stability. Indeed, uh, there is not much uh, time left before its expiration date. Uh, you just uh, mentioned that less than two months, Russia and the United States will either agree to extend the treaty before February the 5th, 2021, or there will be no legal restrictions on their nuclear arsenals for the first time in the past. Let me dot all the eyes in the first place. Russia, as a responsible actor in international relations, is interested in extending new stuff. The extension would prevent the total collapse of the nuclear missiles verification and restriction mechanisms. It would maintain transparency and predictability in relations between the two major nuclear powers, as well as gain time for discussing or negotiating how to adapt arms control regime to current uh, conditions. The treaty is called the gold standard of arms control agreements for a reason. To fulfill its central provisions, Russia and the United States reduce the total number of nuclear warheads by a third, down to 1,550, and lowered the maximum level of deployed delivery vehicles by more than a half, down to 700. I want to emphasize that new start uh, does not limit the development of new and modernization of the existing strategic offensive weapons. Thus, the military and political leadership of our country has repeatedly stated that new intercontinental missile, missile, avant-garde, and Sarmat will be pretty accountable. Unless, of course, the agreement will cease uh, at this. Therefore, New START maintains strategic balance without undermining nuclear support. Important elements of the treaty is level provided both information of the state of their strategic 
328 on site inspections of ICBM, ICBM and heavy bomber sites. Mr. Ambassador, Mr. I'm very, very sorry to interrupt. We seem to be having a slight audio problem. And I'm wondering if you would be able to move slightly closer to the computer that you might get a little bit better sound or it might be just the Wi-Fi connection. I'm very sorry to interrupt, but please continue. Really, again, somebody would like to create additional problems for Russian-American relations. <laughs> Sounding better already. <laughs> Everything. Uh, uh, can happen, of course, can happen, but you see that it's very uh, ridiculous. I just would like to mention that uh, uh, all these measures that I have mentioned, and I don't want to repeat them again, uh, contribute to preventing a new strategic nuclear arms race and a possible nuclear conflict. That's why New START not only meets interest of the United States and Russia, but also benefits the international community as a whole. Uh, it would be unwise to abandon such an effective instrument, particularly since we have nothing to replace uh, it with. Therefore, Russia consistently advocates for the extension of the treaty. Back uh, in December 2019, uh, Russia offered the United States to extend this agreement for five years without any preconditions. And I would like to answer to your question. This offer still stands. However, our partners in Washington are not ready for an unconditional ext extension of new start in exchange for a short-term renewal just for one year. I rem you remember that we are in favor of five years. They have proposed signing a politically binding framework agreement to determine the main parameters of follow-on arms control treaty. On October the 20th, Russia declared its readiness, again readiness, uh, to meet the United States Huawei on two key issues. We agreed to extend the treaty for one year, and we expressed our regret, and to freeze for the same period the number of nuclear warheads that each party possesses. However, this was not enough for the United States negotiators. They insist on an excessively harsh verification regime of the freeze. It's not that we oppose verification uh, regime or verification instruments in general. I would like to emphasize it again. We are not against, moreover, we have verification regime and start treaty. But in this case, uh, such regime would be inconsistent with the subject and format of a political agreement. All verification regime, all verification instruments have to be ratified. It is in accordance with your legislative uh, norms, as well as uh, it, uh, it goes uh, along with the Russian constitution. That's why we cannot uh, take politically binding commitment on uh, verification measure, measure, measures without uh, getting a consent from uh, State Duma, as well as in your case from Senate. Um, and we are sure that it's only through detail and substantive negotiations that we can determine uh, what the next agreements verification mechanism should like uh, look like. I should also say a few words about Washington's persistence ideas on including new systems and participants in arms control negotiations because uh, last maybe three months we discussed this issue very, very uh, thoroughly and in details uh, with our colleagues from State Department and White House. You know very well uh, how much the geopolitical situation has changed since the Cold War and how much progress in military technologies we have uh, made. The role of new factors affecting strategic stability is uh, on the rise. Uh, they include, if you are not surprised, missile defense, global strike systems, hypersonic delivery means, emerging space weapons, etc. To ignore them, it's impossible and downright dangerous. That is why Russia favors 
a comprehensive approach to arms control agreements. As for expanding the negotiating format to new participants, we are open to a multilateral dialogue. However, we believe that forcing anyone to participate in such discussions is counterproductive. Uh, I would like uh, to uh, confirm that our priority is engaging the United Kingdom and France in the arms control dialogue. They have military alliance with the United mm -hmm. States. Moreover, uh, the United States has um, secret cooperation with the uh, uh, UK regarding a nuclear arsenal. And there is exchange of information, there is exchange of uh, weapons. And of course, it's uh, covered with a great uh, level of secrecy. And it is excluded from uh, any uh, discussions between uh, Russia and uh, uh, United States. Moreover, this issue was excluded from the START Treaty. And maybe it's high time for us to look at such cooperation. What is going on? As to China, uh, you see that we know position of China. China has mentioned that at this uh, juncture, China is not ready to start, uh, to not to start, but to, uh, to join us at the table of negotiations. And again, uh, when I'm talking about United uh, UK, France, and China, I would like to say you that uh, they should be their uh, national decision whether they are ready to participate in such negotiations uh, or not. We are ready to search for mutually acceptable solutions for all of these issues I have mentioned. It will uh, require an extremely patient, patient expert work. It is hard to predict how much time it will take, but such efforts will be clearly more effective if supported by stability and predictability in nuclear and missile sphere. Such conditions can only be assured by extension of new start. Concluding my remarks, uh, I would like to know that the uncertain fate of the treaty is uh, uh, but one manifestation of the current alarming state of arms control. We are virtually on the verge of its complete collapse and a nuclear and missile arms race that will inevitably follow. Russia seeks to avoid such negative development. We have recently put forward a number of peace initiatives. However, this administration has consistently rejected them. All while uh, speaking about uh, the need uh, to achieve overwhelming military dominance and accusing us of uh, aggression, you can find such articles every morning and you will open any American newspaper and you will get more and more information on this. I would like to give you a couple of examples. Russia proposes to declare reciprocal moratorium on the deployment of ground-based intermediate and shorter range missiles. In response, the administration states it's uh, plan to deploy several batteries of INF systems in Europe and other regions for 2023. Another example. We insist on the CTBT entry into force at the earliest possible day. The United States refuses to ratify the treaty. Its example is followed by other countries. I don't want to name names. Uh, uh, their participation in the agreement is necessary for entry into force. Uh, this is a very important uh, treaty. This is around the Open Skies Treaty is even less consistent. All states parties to the treaty, including Russia, speak of the possibility to resolve differences at the negotiating table. All of the participant parties they understand the importance of preserving transparency and confidence building measures. Nevertheless, Washington has decided to withdraw from the uh, treaty. And frankly, I don't know what will be the future of this treaty because uh, of such has created many problems for us uh, how to implement this treaty. In these circumstances, it would be particularly timely for Russia and the United States to confirm the Gorbachev Reagan formula that a nuclear war cannot be won, it must never be fought. Thus, our countries would acknowledge the inadmissibility of the use of nuclear weapons, regardless of the ill and would put 
an end to the speculations about the so-called escalate to de-escalate concept. Russia approaches the United States with this idea uh, back in October 2018, 20, uh, two years ago. We have also submitted a similar proposal for consideration by the P5. Unfortunately, we have not yet succeeded in either bilateral or multilateral uh, format. Nevertheless, we continue our efforts to promote this and many other peace initiatives. And in doing so, we are guided by the understanding of the special responsibility for maintaining global security borne by Russia as one of the two major nuclear power. You have started from this phases, and it's very important that we are the largest uh, nuclear weapon states, we are the uh, great uh, powers, we are members, permanent members of Security Council, and we bear special responsibility for international peace and international security. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. One very quick, and I hope it will be quick, uh, clarification. Are there any last minute ongoing negotiations with the Trump administration on New START? Or are you totally focusing now on the new incoming administration? Uh, frankly, you see that I'm ready to uh, have a lunch uh, with my uh, um, uh, interlocutor even today. And I'm ready to discuss a uh, problem of extension of this uh, treaty. It goes without saying. So I just would like to say you the doors of our negotiating team are open and we are ready to continue such dialogue. Uh, I understand that uh, it's very important for the United States uh, to have bipartisan uh, support or consent for a potential uh, treaty agreement with uh, the Russian Federation. And uh, I'm ready to work with Republicans and with Democrats. It's up to them whether they are willing to see me, whether they're ready to listen to me, whether they're ready to speak to me directly, openly, but not through mass media. And I can see that, that uh, it could be a very interesting conversation. By the way, if you permit me, just only quick, I tried to approach many members of Senate uh, my uh, proposal, uh, let's sit together. Could I explain you a substance of START treaty? Could I explain you why we are in favor of arms control with the United States? What kind of advantage or disadvantage we have? What kind of advantage and disadvantage United States can get from a uh, uh, negotiating table or the results of our negotiations with the United States? But uh, you see that. Uh, my regret, uh, you said that there was no any, uh, there is no any opportunity for me to meet today. I hope that uh, after 20th of uh, January, there will be a good possibility for me to discuss this issue. I'm ready to come to Senate. Okay, good to hear that. Uh, Michael Gordon, you heard a lot. That was a very full conversation by uh, the ambassador. Uh, I'm sure your journalist pen is itching to either write or you're itching to say something. Let me just kick you off with one idea, but you can take it where you want. That idea, that separate agreement uh, that was offered about the freeze um, on warheads of all ranges for one year, um, why, is that, why is that important? And that was, that was different. That was a separate you know, offer from New Start. Why is that important? Or feel free to pick up on anything the ambassador said. Okay, well, uh, thank you, um, Jill. And to the audience, Jill and I were both in Moscow at the same time, uh, based here as correspondents. Um, and I'm here, obviously, in my kind of personal capacity, representing nobody and n nothing. But um, I have a few thoughts. I mean, first off, I mean, it's a little sad that we're having this conversation at all because what we're essentially talking about, but necessary, is extending uh, an arms control agreement as a stopgap. Uh, we're not really talking about any um, uh, further agreement that's uh, immediately at hand that might do more than New START. But it seems that, you know, as a practical step, extending New START, uh, there's certainly a lot of logic to that to buy time to do something more. But one thing I've observed just as a journalist is neither the Russian Federation nor the Biden incoming Biden administration has ever really defined what that something more should be. 
Um, you know, the Russian Federation certainly doesn't like the Trump administration proposal, but it's never really spelled out its own vision of what the next step should be in arms control and, and is part of an agreement that could be negotiated. I'm not even sure it's said whether there should be further reductions in nuclear weapons or whether tactical nuclear weapons can be on the table. So um, on the Russian side, they've been clear to object to the Trump policy, not spelled out what they themselves would favor. Um, and on the uh, Biden administration, it's quite clear that uh, President-elect Biden favors New START extension. Um, and he's described it as a foundation for future arms control arrangements, not agreements, arrangements. But um, the, the new team that's coming in has not spelled out, it has, wasn't a campaign issue certainly, what these new arrangements should be uh, in any detail. So I, I think that's just an observation I make. And I have a, a few just questions to put um, just based on the ambassador's statement, just to maybe he could clarify his position um, further. But um, a question I had, uh, Jill, was um, you mentioned President Putin put on the table there should be a one-year freeze on, on um, nuclear warheads of all types. And this would... Um, last for the same period of New START extension. Um, my question for the ambassador would be, um, uh, is this, um, I presume this proposal is still on the table for the incoming Biden administration. And if uh, President-elect Biden were to extend START for five years instead of one year, would this uh, nuclear warhead freeze uh, last for five years? Would uh, the Russian side be prepared uh, to uh, commit to that. And then also the um, uh, president like Biden has said uh, during the campaign that he, he said that the sole purpose of US nuclear weapons in his view should be to deter a nuclear strike. This is not a no first use uh, statement, but it's a, a bit of a move in that direction. The sole purpose with the Russian Federation embrace uh, that sort of declaration on its part? And what would it mean since, as I understand Russian military doctrine, they basically reserve the right to use nuclear weapons to defend against a conventional attack, much as NATO has done uh, for many years. So if, if the ambassador could clarify, you know, would, is it possible a nuclear freeze, a warhead freeze could last for more than one year? Could it last for five years if New START was extended for five years? And how do you assess President-elect Biden's assertion that the sole purpose of nuclear weapons should be to deter a nuclear strike and not a conventional attack or a chemical attack or even a cyber attack? Mr. Something up that's in the news. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, of course, um, you are know, raising very sensitive issues, very important issues, and I understand that all journalists, uh, specialists, would like to know answers to these uh, questions. So what I would like to say to you first, Michael, you said that uh, you're you're right, uh, saying that we would like to uh, not to permit collapse of um, uh, our cooperation with the United States. Uh, please don't forget that we have had such cooperation within 50 years. Is what who was in administration, whether Democrats or Republicans. Even during the Cold War, we still had a unification regime. Very uh, thoroughly, uh, uh, how to say, elaborated. Uh, and we know a uh, time when uh, your inspectors uh, were sitting uh, the portals of our plants uh, where we uh, create a nuclear uh, uh, delivery systems. Uh, but it was during the Cold War. And I remember uh, 11 years ago, and issues with the team of those, got Mueller, who uh, tried to persuade us that we have been living not in Cold War area, and it's high time for us to change uh, our attitude uh, towards arms control limitations and mechanisms that were elaborating during the Cold War. We create more 
could I say, light mechanism of verification because we have an excellent history uh, uh, communication on these issues. And we know all your strategic basis of nuclear weapons and your military guys know our strategic uh, nuclear uh, weapons. What will be the next? Of course, it's a good question. And today, I cannot say you what will be the subject of a future negotiations. I remember how we started 11 or 12 years ago. We sit together, together and we started uh, explaining uh, what we want, what we would like to limit, wh where we would like to see transparency. We decided to take a list of paper and put all elements that could combine us. And then in the end, our presidents uh, identified what a key issue should be, uh, should be in a potential uh, arrangement, agreement, uh, understanding, and so on. So it's not easy to say today what will be in, uh, in the court. One more issue that Michael mentioned, you see that he mentioned that it could be new arrangements. You see that I don't trust new arrangements. I prefer legally binding treaty. I can explain you uh, why I have such a negative uh, position. JCPOA, legally, it's not legally, it's politically binding commitment by one administration. And immediately when another administration uh, came to a White House, that administration has decided to leave such arrangement. So we need more predictability when we are talking about uh, Amsterdam Road. I many times during my meetings with a journalist, with a specialist, I uh, used uh, uh, to explain a uh, uh, Japanese proverb that it's very easy to destroy a church within one year, but it will be needed three years to construct a new one. So as to uh, uh, proposal made by President Putin to uh, this current administration regarding extension of, uh, for one year start treaty and freeze all types uh, and where this proposal is. It seems to me that this proposal is uh, in uh, White House now. And it will be till 20th of uh, January. We would like to see who will come to administration. We will, uh, would like to know who they are. And it seems to me that we have to start from the step scratch because we have nothing with this administration regarding any agreements in arms control. What we have now, there is just only a legally binding document that we call golden standard. That's all. Let's decide. Should we keep first? Then we will negotiate other issues that are very important for United States. And please don't forget that the Russian Federation has, has its own uh, position, has its own concern regarding United States policy. It's normal. It's normal. We are an independent country and we have our concerns. And you said what uh, this administration has done. This administration has decided to put on the table just only uh, ideas that could uh, meet interests of United States, ignoring, ignoring, totally ignoring uh, Russian concerns. Some of them we expressed 10 years ago, and I'm ready to mention it, just only one, to save time, missile defense. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, a question came in, and I think maybe a couple of questions already I'd like to address, and Michael, um, I think it's important that you put these in perspective because of your understanding of this issue. One from William Courtney is, will an extension of New START have a positive impact on other areas of U.S.-Russian relations, or is this a wholly separate issue? And that's something that I've been thinking about. Is there more to the U.S.-Russia relationship than simply arms control? Mr. Ambassador, if you can keep it very short, and then I want to hear from Michael, and then we'll get some more questions in. Thank you. So will it improve other positive impact on other areas of the relationship? During the Cold War period, strategic stability issues were a core of our, or heart of our uh, relations. And of course, 
I'm working here not a representative of my president on strategic stability. I'm representative of the Russian Federation on all issues. And I would like to have pragmatic, uh, friendly relations with the United States on various issues, including science, technology, uh, belly. I would like uh, you to enjoy uh, uh, Russian painting, uh, Russian artists. Uh, so I'm sure that if we restore trust between the United States and Russia, uh, basing uh, on uh, strategic stability, of course, I'm sure it will improve Russian relations. I hope. So. Thank you. Michael, can I ask you about um, verification? I mean, one, there is a question about that, and I, it's a, always been a very big issue. The question is quite specific. It has to do with um, other proposals for verifying, for counting nuclear warheads that are not deployed on strategic offensive uh, delivery systems. And the question is, would the Russian Federation, this is, I know, a question for the ambassador, but let me hear Michael on this for a second. The question is, would the Russian Federation be prepared to discuss on-site inspections or portal monitoring of warhead storage sites or other sites where warheads are manufactured? Why is that, that why has uh, verification always been such a thorny issue? Um, should we just continue with what we've got? Is, is there something that we could move in that direction? What do you think? Well, I mean, it's an excellent uh, question. And um, it's the expectation, as the ambassador knows, of the American Congress that any uh, future arms control treaty, if there ever is one, uh, would um, cover um, not merely strategic systems, but also Russian tactical uh, nuclear systems. And so then the question arises, how do you uh, verify that and how do you monitor it? And what the Trump administration was looking for was a declaration by each side of how many of sort of non-strategic uh, warheads it had. And then it, it had an idea that it wasn't actually ready to deploy this idea in practice quite yet, but in an idea for monitoring this, where you would set up a, uh, a system outside of warhead production facilities, uh, sort of as was done in, in a certain sense during the INF treaty outside with Kinsk, um, to monitor warheads kind of coming in and out. And so uh, that was in lieu of going to every individual site where warheads might be deployed, but it would give you a fix on how many new ones were coming in and how many warheads were being retired. This is the so-called portal monitoring system, which was more of an idea than an actual capability the US was ready to deploy. The ambassador said something very interesting on this, which I, I think he could um, explain further. Um, what happened in the talks with the Trump administration is the Russians rejected this idea, and that was the end of the uh, framework agreement. But um, he said that, um, Ambassador, you said that uh, you, you, know, you certainly couldn't agree to verification as part of a framework agreement, it would have to be as part of a treaty. So I guess the question would be, if uh, tactical nuclear warheads were encompassed by a future arms control treaty, um, that was to be ratified uh, by the Senate, um, would Russia accept at least the principle that there should be some degree of intrusive verification to monitor the number of these tactical warheads? You said it wasn't acceptable for a political agreement, but you left the door open as a treaty. Is that something Russian would accept? And might you even consider a portal monitoring arrangement or do you have some other idea? For how to go about this that you would like the Americans to consider? Could I answer? Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's for you. I'm not sure whether you can hear me or not. We can, now we can. Uh, so you said uh, some questions. Uh, again, verification mechanism, verification proceed. Mr. Ambassador, could you again move just a little closer? I do think that helped the sound. And even to kiss uh, this screen, you say all day. <laughs> we can do that later. <laughs> so verification and control mechanism of any agreement, of any arrangement, 
uh, like, for example, it was done in JCPOA. Um, but uh, I hope that everybody understands the differences between uh, the status of JCPOA and uh, START Treaty Agreement. First of all, we have to deal with the subject scope of any agreement. Then we will decide what kind of verification measures uh, we will take on board and what kind of uh, measures will be enough for us to be sure that central uh, parts or central limitations of this treaty are fulfilled and there is no any uh, hesitation in opposite uh, uh, party that uh, uh, for example, Russia is violating one or another uh, ceiling that will be identified in this treaty. We should start discussing verification mechanism, whether it should be intrusive or it should be uh, more light and then it was fixed in a start treaty. Uh, I would like to repeat that it was American proposal to forget about portal uh, verification system that was existing during INF treaty period, during the cold treaty period. It was American proposal to make uh, this verification more easy. We were reluctant at that time, but they persuaded us. And you see that how situation has changed. And now uh, some, at least some specialists uh, in the United States are insisting to see more intrusive measures regarding any subject that will be a core of a potential a new treaty. Today, I cannot say you uh, whether what kind of verification regime will be, but I would like to assure you for 100%, we will not agree on any portal verification mechanism that existed when INF treaty was working. It was decision of United States to withdraw from this treaty. It was decision of United States to destroy that mechanism. And we are not ready to take just only this mechanism from that old one treaty and put it in a new one without understanding what will be subject, what will be the scope of uh, this uh, uh, negotiation. Another question that Michael has mentioned, he said to me, uh, there, there was a decision of Senate regarding uh, some elements of a new potential treaty. And he has mentioned nuclear, uh, 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 tactical nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear or non-strategic uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, you see that. Uh, I'm not sure that it will not be enough one hour to explain where we are on this issue, because uh, what we are concerned, what we are talking now, we are talking about deterrence capabilities. Tactical nuclear weapons, non-strategic nuclear weapons. It's not a, uh, I want to say it's a, a threat for us because we are talking about United States system that could reach the Russian territory. There is difference in identification. What is tactical nuclear weapons in the United States and in the Russian Federation? There is no definition at all. So we have to sit again, we have to permit our expert to sit and to discuss what we want to discuss and what kind of subject will be. Moreover, it's very important that your tactical weapons, how we understand, is, uh, uh, is deployed in Europe, in the various European countries. And these bombs can be delivered to the Russian territory very quickly. We consider them strategic by nature because there is a principle, so-called uh, principle was elaborated during start one, Kamchatka, Alaska, two parts of United States and Russian Federation that are very close. And we see whether your weapon can reach Russian territory and whether American uh, weapon can reach so it means that if we see such situation, it means it means that we are talking about strategic weapon, and what, and we have to concentrate on uh, 
weapons that are the most dangerous for you. Mm -hmm. uh, let's permit our negotiators to uh, deal with this issue. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Again, don't, Jill, don't forget that President Putin uh, has decided to freeze all weapons, all nuclear weapons, without saying whether it is strategic one or tactical one, all nuclear weapons, as it was proposed uh, or put uh, on the table of negotiations by this administration for one year, taking into account that strategic factors that are very important, cybersecurity, uh, missile defense, conventional weapons, weapons will be discussed during uh, negotiation that could be started immediately after extension of start treaty. See, that's the thing. Thank you. Um, I think that's very important and it kind of pushes our discussion. I almost felt that we were in the midst of arms control negotiations right now because obviously you know the subject very, very well. But let's broaden it out a little bit. And if I could return, and Michael, this is for you. Um, if I could return to the idea of China, I know in the beginning, the Trump administration made it a very important point that they wanted to bring China into any new agreement. Initially, Russia said, no, the Chinese are not interested and we aren't either. And there seems to be a bit of um, evolution of that view because now I hear the ambassador saying it's a national decision uh, for other countries. Michael, um, why was it so important for the Trump administration to insist in the beginning that China be brought in? Is it actually important? And going forward to other agreements that we might have, uh, is it worth it? Should it? Should China be part of these agreements uh, going forward? Um, I, I think that uh, for the um, it's a it's a excellent and, and uh, not an easy question uh, for the Trump administration, uh, for which I'm not the spokesman. The um, you know their their concern is that China is really the primary rising threat to American national security and Russia is a secondary proximate threat, but a secondary threat. And they, China is involved in a military buildup and they are increasing the number of their uh, nuclear uh, delivery systems, although they're, and, and warheads, although according to the Pentagon, they're still in the low 200s in terms of operationally deployed warheads, which is a small fraction of what Russia and the United States have, but they could grow in the future. So the mechanism uh, the Trump administration proposed was three-way talks, and they were insistent that China be involved. I mean, uh, and that just didn't come to pass, and I, is probably unlikely to come to pass, uh, certainly in, in the current environment. Uh, that said, on the American side, uh, there is a, a growing recognition, including among um, Democratic uh, arms control experts like Rose Gottmuller, for example, that uh, there needs to be some sort of arms control uh, dialogue and discussions with China, probably bilaterally, um, and uh, to, to uh, try to uh, capture their systems, um, limit their systems, get a better understanding of their capabilities, uh, avoid miscalculation. Um, I don't know that the Biden team has really pronounced itself on that, and I think their decision to just proceed with New START extension on its own merits suggests that they would probably conduct these things um, separately. Um, I have one thought, Jill, I just would like to follow up on one of the questions Bill Courtney asked, a very good question, but I'd like to put to the ambassador. He, uh, he had asked, Ambassador Courtney had asked, um, you know, if arms control advances, might that improve US-Russian relations? And my question for the ambassador would be a little bit of the converse, which is, um, I guess it's possible to have arms control negotiations um, that are carried out in the midst of difficult relations that was done during the Cold War. But uh, Mr. Ambassador, do you think there are steps uh, both sides, including the Russian Federation could take um, uh, as a gesture of goodwill um, toward the incoming administration to create a better atmosphere for arms control talks. I mean, right now we have um, very profound differences between the two sides on everything from 
uh, attempted killings of Navalny to cyber intrusion and American agencies. Um, but do you think there are steps that um, might be taken at the outset of the Biden administration to improve atmospheres for negotiations, generally including arms control? And I'd be remiss if I just didn't ask you, since it's in the news today, uh, is it the case, as the Americans say, that uh, Russia carried out a cyber intrusion into uh, American agencies um, to try to steal information, or do you, or do you consider that a, not a valid allegation? Mr. Ambassador? Yes, you see that uh, now it's clear for me who Michael is. He is not a member of this administration because he mentioned that we are second threat for the United States, because this administration is considered that we are imminent threat and China is just only the second one. So it's clear for me, yes. I trust, Michael, that you are not from uh, this administration. You're right, you're 100 times right that we need more favorable atmosphere in Russian-American relations. We, who, we should, create more favorable atmosphere for our uh, dialogue. But Michael, uh, you understand that I get a salary here. Uh, and, uh, my purpose is to stabilize and to improve uh, Russian-American relations. How can I get it if some key officials from Washington don't want to see me? I sent so many letters. Congress with just only Jill, with just only one request. Could I pay a courtesy call? Could I talk to you? Could I explain where we are? Could I say what we want, what we don't want? Could I say a few words about publications that I can see every day in your newspapers that Russia is a devil and, and so on? You see that, but there is no opportunity for me uh, to speak. There is no opportunity for me to discuss. Michael, I need your assistance. I need your assistance as a journalist. You said that, help me. Could you, for example, organize a lunch? Could you organize a dinner? Could you invite some guys from uh, Congress? We will sit together. We will discuss. I will bring caviar. I will bring vodka. And you see that I will create a good atmosphere for our discussion. Yes, your question. Regarding uh, so-called cyber uh, uh, cyber attack by Russian side, I uh, would like to say you, if you permit me, just only thirty seconds. Uh, we have published on our uh, embassy resources, informational resources, uh, two paras on this issue. We paid attention to another unfounded attempts of the U.S. media to blame Russia for hacking attacks on US government bodies. We declare responsibly. Michael, you see that uh, it's for you especially. Malicious activities in the information space contradict the principles of foreign policy of Russian Federation. I will not continue. It's possible to find it uh, on our side. Michael, you see that uh, I would like you to understand that I have offered this administration Maybe for, uh, for it, you are a journalist, it will be very interesting. I said that let's stop talking through mass media to each other. Let's organize meeting for FBI senior officials, CIA senior officials, our guys from intelligence and counterintelligence. We will provide space. I will leave this hall. Let them talk professionally, professionally on all problems that we face. Let's try to narrow gaps of understanding and let, let's try to elaborate some code of conduct, for example. Uh, let's speak to each other on this. Nobody wants to do it, nobody. But every day I see just only a side statement. So you say that it's possible to say, Michael, for example, that uh, you uh, have stolen my money. You will say, Mr. Ambassador, how it could be possible? I said, come on, I will publish tomorrow uh, in my um, uh, mass media uh, newspapers uh, this report. And it is very difficult to prove that you didn't do it. How could I prove that uh, I'm not, uh, that I'm innocent if I didn't do it? Let's sit together, let's discuss, 
Let's restart our dialogue. We are ready for it. Okay, we are, we are just almost at the top of the hour. I said we'd go one hour and we pretty much will, but I have one more question. And actually it comes in from a colleague of ours. We know Pavel Shadikov um, who, from Moscow. And he asks a question that is very similar to this, but takes it in another direction. He says, um, uh, you know, regardless of New START, arms control clearly goes beyond nuclear weapons issues. And there's been a long uh, history of Russia and the United States disagreeing on the internet governance issues. So what he's asking is, um, what, uh, kind of similar to what Michael is saying, we have this breaking news about the hacking. You've answered it as officially the ambassador, the uh, embassy has. However, what Pavel is asking is, do you see in what way the cybersecurity issue could be part of the arms control agenda? Mr. Ambassador? It must be. It must be. Moreover, I would like to remind you just only uh, a few weeks ago, um, Russian president has introduced no, new ideas to the United States how to restart uh, negotiations on information security. We have put uh, a program of a potential cooperation. And it's not just only take it or leave it. It's a proposal to negotiate. It's a proposal to discuss. It's an invitation for our partners to start such dialogue. But to my regret, I failed to explain. Maybe uh, it's not, it's enough, uh, not enough uh, in my professionalism to persuade uh, this administration to start such activities. And I hope that, Michael, maybe you will come to me. I will show some documents to you. Uh, after our lunch, uh, you will use uh, your newspaper to explain what Russia wants. We would like to start such cooperation. We are, uh, we are dependent upon the wish or of your administration. And I hope that next administration uh, will be more uh, to Russian proposals on various issues, not just only on this one. Okay, thank you. Michael, um, I have to say, you've got a good offer on the table, vodka, caviar, and a whole lot of information. So. Take us out. We're, we're literally at the end of our time. But what do you? Your last thoughts, and then I will thank both of you, Michael. Well, um, I think that um, there, um, the incoming uh, administration has a lot of reasons to be uh, skeptical of Russian intentions, but they also do seek some areas of cooperation, and one of those um, is arms control and a new start. And so I think there is the, um, uh, certainly, I think it's highly likely, if not certain, that new start will be extended. And I think there is the um, potential, at least, to come up with um, more far-reaching arms control, maybe even reductions in weapons and things of that sort. So that's sort of my uh, big uh, takeaway from there. And um, one thing I, um, I, I think, Jill, we should just let the ambassador clarify before we go, is uh, I thought he said that the the warhead um, freeze was for the current administration and then the new team would come in and they would sort of see what who they were and what that was all about. Is the warhead freeze for the uh, Biden administration? Is that something that's on the table for them to work with uh, just coming in? I just think that's an important, such an important thing that be good to get that um, clarified very explicitly. Thank you, Michael. Mr. Ambassador? We have to start from the scratch. There will be new administration. There will be new discussion. There will be a new proposal. Uh, what to put on the core of our potential agreement. Uh, let's wait for a while, just only one month and a half, and we will see whether the uh, incoming administration is ready to extend the start treaty or not. And it's very important to understand uh, what kind of world uh, we will face uh, on 21st of uh, January. And just only a few uh, sentences in the end, Jill, I would like to, uh, to thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. I wish everybody a Merry Christmas. 
we we don't celebrate in on our embassy, but this year we decided to celebrate, and it will be day off for all of my diplomats as well, and uh, we will celebrate also a new year. What you see that uh, we are tired of bad Russian-American relations. So many problems, so many accusations. There is no possibility to explain where we are. There is a lack of dialogue between you, Americans and uh, Russians. We would like uh, to see such context more uh, next year. We hope that uh, new uh, fresh uh, wind will come to uh, White House and spring will come and uh, there will be a new uh, round of Russian-American dialogue on various issues and strategic stability will be in the center. Thank you very much. I wish you uh, good health and uh, take care of yourself. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Anatoly Antonov, the Russian ambassador to the United States, and Michael Gordon from the Wall Street Journal. Thank you very much. Um, I have to say, Mr. Ambassador, I can see you're a very good negotiator and a very good diplomat. So thank you for that. And I'm going to throw it back to Dr. Angela Stent. And I have to say um, many thanks uh, this year for all the support that CERES, C-E-R-E-S, the Center for East European Russian and, uh, and uh, Eurasian, Russian and East European Studies at Georgetown University, and also for the very important support by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. So Dr. Stent, back to you. Thank you. I will just echo everything you've said. Thank both of our panelists. This was an excellent discussion. We certainly do hope for a spring and better things. Um, and again, I'd like to thank the Carnegie Corporation that has made all this possible to thank you, Jill, for doing an excellent job of moderation. And we'll see you all in the new year for our next event. Thank you.